Okay, so I'm going to make this section pretty quick since we're a little bit behind. Um, but uh, my name is Nathan again, and uh, I'm CEO of Founder Suite. In case you don't know of us, we're a funding stack, so we make an investor search, an investor CRM, and an investor updater tool. Uh, we're used by startups in every major accelerator. And startups using us have raised over $120 million since March, so we're getting some good results around our platform. Before launching Founder Suite, kind of like Gil was saying, I was helping startups as interim finance guy, and I just wanted to build some software to, to help the process of fundraising, so that's what we did. Um, and then before that, I spent about 10 years working with different startups, Kickstarter and Clicker and a few others that had some good results. So I've been through the fundraising process a few times. I'm going to share a few of the, the lessons learned. But first, let's start off on how not to do it. So Hunter Walk is a, a VC with Homebrew. And I think this just perfectly captures how not to do it. You know, you, you want to go raise some money, you just start asking people you know, hey, who should I be talking to? It seems logical, right? It's a natural thought process. But the problem with that is it puts, puts the burden of figuring out who you should be pitching on the person you're talking to. And that burden of figuring that out really needs to be on your shoulders. Um, you know, so kind of the, the philosophy that we as espouse and that I think uh, helps a lot of startups go through this process of fundraising is to really think of it as a sales process, right? In any good sales process, you build a list of leads into your funnel, you qualify those leads, make sure those leads are right for you and you're right for them. And then you push it all towards a decision, yes or no process, right? Um, and I can send this deck to anyone who wants it, but again, if you think of it as a sales process, you, you know, you think of it as a funnel. What are we doing? We're building a large list of investors. We're filtering it down, finding the warm introductions to those investors, like Gil was saying, and then you know, going through the process of pitching, due diligence, and ultimately you're selling shares of your company, right? It is a sales process. So if you think about fundraising and sales process, it actually takes some of the stress and anxiety out of it. Um, all right, so step number one, you know, building your funnel. How do you do this? Um, uh, a couple different ways, but really fundraising is a numbers game. Uh, Elizabeth Yin of 500 Startups has a great blog post saying, if you haven't pitched 150 investors, you haven't actually tried to fundraise. Um, you know, I, I talk to the startups all the time that go out and talk 10 or 15, and they're frustrated they're not getting someone to to bite on their deal. I'm like, you haven't really even tried yet. Um, and you know, so we always say, get at least 100, maybe even 200 investors in the top of your funnel. We'll filter those down the next step. But if you're hitting 5% of the people you're talking to coming in on your deal, that's actually a pretty good ratio. So a couple ways to build your funnel. Angelist, of course, is a great resource. About 25,000 angels and some VCs in there. Um, you can search by different criteria. They're changing it up a little bit. Every time I go to Angelist, it's like differently formatted. I was looking for a list of syndicates, like Gil was saying, and it's kind of buried. But still a lot of you know, good data in Angelist. I have two uh, Founder Suite plug slides. I'll make them very quick. But we have a, a search tool in Founder Suite. It's free to use. You can search by location and uh, market. We've got about 50,000 investors there, angels, VCs, and some private equity. Crunchbase is a great resource. You know, what I advise folks to do is go find companies similar to yours that aren't directly competitive and figure out who funded those companies at your stage of development, right? And then, you know, lots of other places to find investors for the top of your funnel if you really start to look. PE Hub and VentureWire both have daily newsletters of every deal that got funded. One of uh, Founder Suite's users went through, paid an intern to go through the last two years of VentureWire and pick out deals uh, in their space, right? And just pick out leads from it. Looking at conferences, if you're in artificial intelligence or drones, go, you know, Google Drone Conference 2016 and you're, you're going to find at least five or ten investors that were speaking on panels there. Investors like to carve a, 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 or make a name for themselves in a space by getting out there and speaking. So you can find people that are, you know, really kind of on the edge of the space. TechCrunch, of course, pretty obvious. Quora is actually a pretty good place to find lists of investors. You can search on almost any category, you know, top e-commerce seed investors in the area. You're going to find a list for that. And then other sources like Pitchbook, Metamark, these cost a decent amount of money, but they're pretty easily searchable for your phone. 
And then, you know, this bottom sentence here, Yoda says, start to look, you start to see. When you sort of tune into your, or tune your radar to fundraising, you just start to see investors in your space all over the place. Okay, so we built a list of 100 to 200 investors. Now it's time to filter and qualify that list. And this really is important. Um, in the lower right-hand corner here, I say diligently cut down your list now for a better hit rate later. And this is really important. I've made this mistake myself of not filtering or qualifying my list of investors. And you know, you get someone who wants to take a meeting. That's encouraging. It's exciting when someone wants to meet with you. But I spent an hour and a half driving down to Mountain View, realized we're too early for them or really not the right space for them. An hour and a half drive back, I just wasted half a day meeting with someone I didn't qualify, right? So how do you qualify? Obviously looking at Crunchbase and seeing if they've invested in competitive deals. Um, looking at the Venture Wire, PE Hub, and other sources like that and seeing if the fund has raised money in the last two or three years. If they haven't raised a new fund, they're probably just doing deals, they're doubling down on their previous investments, so probably not taking in too many new investments. Um, same with angels. If they haven't done a new angel deal in the last six or eight months, they're probably taking a break from angel investing. Might not be worth your time. Wrong sector, stage, and geographic location. You can usually figure that out just by looking at people's websites, LinkedIn profiles, and, uh, and angel list pages. And then bad reputation. This is a little trickier. You know, a lot of accelerators are great resources to talking to your peers who've gone out and pitched an investor and uh, identifying kind of the bad actors in the group. Um, a site called thefunded.com. It's a little bit old school. I don't think it's been updated in about a decade, but it has a lot of good ratings on VCs. Um, so again, spending time qualifying your list, thinking about the sales process, trying to remove 25 to 30 percent of the investors off your list, you know, from your initial funnel, will save you a lot of time and pain later. All right, step number three is trying to get that warm introduction to every single person on your filtered target list. Just like Joe was saying, you know, getting a warm introduction is really critical. Um, what do you do? You go open up their LinkedIn page and see if you have any first or, first or second degree mutual connections, and then you spend a little time looking at who is the strongest connection for you. If you don't have a first or second degree connection, what do you do? One tactic some of our, our users do is um, you know, looking at Gill's portfolio companies, looking at the founders, see if they have any way to get in touch with those founders, right? Because founders will often be helpful to other founders. Uh, you can take the kind of informational interview requests, like, hey, I'm interested in pitching, you know, I'm interested in, in Gil and what he's doing. Can I hear how the process has been working with him? Get a little dialogue going. More often than not, they'll be willing to make an introduction if they like what you're doing. So kind of working the, the founder network is pretty good. And then last but not least, if you absolutely can't find any connection in, you know, a really nicely customized, personalized email will sometimes get a response. Okay, while you're in uh, LinkedIn, something I do, we're fundraising right now, I do this uh, hours and hours doing this, I'll go to Connector Friends, Jeff is a buddy of mine who works at NASDAQ, has a large, large base of connections, and I will go in the right hand um, side of the screen, I will search his LinkedIn, type the word investor, he's got 668 people in his network that have tagged themselves as an investor, and I'll go page by page, opening up their links and seeing if anyone looks relevant to what I'm doing. Out of, I actually did this with Jeff. Out of about 600 people, I picked out about 20 people that looked relevant, and Jeff made about five intros for me. Todd, who's our speaker, I did this to you, I think when we were doing our seed round too, I kind of scraped your LinkedIn network and you made a bunch of introductions for me. It's a really efficient way, not efficient, but it's a really uh, a somewhat painful but effective way of getting good intros. All right, you've got your list of 200, you've filtered it down to maybe 150 really well scrapped targets, you've mapped your connection into each of those investors, uh, found someone who can make an introduction to 80% of them, hopefully. Um, now you need a way, and you're about to start you know, asking for the intros and getting the dialogue going, you need some way of keeping track of all this. Google Spreadsheets one answer, my second product placement slide is Thunder Street. Well, that doesn't look good, but Fundstream has a really nice Kanban board or, or uh, kind of like a Trello board for fundraising. 
Uh, or you, you know, some people use CRMs like Salesforce or others, but you need something to keep track of all the people you're talking to, all the discussions you're having, uh, all the follow-up activities. Every investor meeting is going to lead to like two or three action items, updating your pitch deck, your model, you know, getting reference checks, whatever it may, may be. You need some way of keeping track of all your fundraise when you're talking to investors at scale. And that's very important, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, because you want to get momentum around your deal. So you need a tracking system. Of course, we recommend Founder Street plug. All right, you're ready to start the conversation. So um, Jeff, I showed you the example a few minutes ago. I went through his LinkedIn, picked out all these guys who looked pretty relevant. I sent him this email. This is not asking for the introduction. This is asking if he's willing to make an introduction to any of these people. And it's a lightweight introduction, right? And um, Jeff is a very busy guy. He works at NASDAQ. The more connected someone is, the more valuable their introductions usually are, and the busier they are. So the easier you need to make it, right? These are really important fundamental things for any fundraiser. Jeff looks at this list and he responds back with a little check mark next to about four or five of these guys that he knows well enough to make an introduction. Some of the other ones he said, oh, well, these guys aren't doing any deals or you're not fit for them. So we crossed them off the list. So we've done another degree of qualifying and filtering. But I made it very easy for Jeff. I'm going to emphasize that several times. OK, for each of the five that Jeff responded back saying, yeah, I can do interest of these, I create a new email, a fresh email, a clean email with the subject line. At this point, we had a lead investor committed, so that's always a nice teaser in the subject line. Hi, Jeff, good chatting with you. We're raising a seed round. FF is leading it. Here's a link to the deck. Can you make an introduction? And then all Jeff has to do is forward this along with a quick, hey, do you want to take the intro to Nate? Yes or no, right? He doesn't have to type up a summary of our business. He doesn't have to do anything other than click forward and do you want the intro, the opt-in approach, right? And again, Jeff's super busy, well-connected. Making it easy means these asks get done, right? There's a very strong relationship between making it easy and actually having someone take action on your fundraising. Okay, so we've started the process. We're actually fundraising now. You gotta kind of jump all the way into this. And you know, I'd love, I'm sure you've all seen uh, Silicon Valley. Um, you know, Richard, who's not a natural hustler, not a, a pitch guy, he's an introvert, an engineer, has to go into pitch mode, right? And, and this is a hard thing for a lot of founders to kind of make the mental adjustment to go into pitch mode, but it's what you have to do. Um, you kind of have to channel a little Richard here and, uh, and get up there and start, you know, pressing the flesh and, and putting up with all the antics of investors. There's a lot of, as you saw with Jill, he's an investor, a lot of interesting personalities, big personalities out there that you're meeting with asking for money. So switch into your hustle mode. Um, just a few tips on, on hustle mode. We've talked about getting introduced. We've talked about making it easy for your introducer. Um, on the pitch, the middle section here, you know, A-B test your pitch. It's kind of interesting. By the time we actually raised our seed round, I was actually on version 42, no exaggeration, of our pitch deck. Like, we had literally gone through that many iterations of the pitch. And it got very, you know, it was much stronger, uh, much bolder, and, and uh, a bigger vision by the end of it than where we started. Um, and we, I tested out different versions of the pitch, different, like, big idea concepts, right? Every, every investor, like Gil was saying with the, the gambling Twilio, Twilio for gambling, Everyone wants to hang their hat on some big idea. And so I tested out a couple different kind of big idea, A-B testing of big idea pitches. On the process, we've done all this hard upfront work of searching, filtering, mapping our investors. And we want to do this blitzkrieg approach of dropping as many intro bombs, as I call it, in as uh, condensed time frame as possible. Because uh, what you want to do is get momentum around your deal. I kind of make the joke that investors have an innate ability to smell momentum or to smell uh, desperation, right? And either of those has a big impact on the attractiveness of your deal. So the more meetings you can pack into a week, uh, there's just sort of an aura that exudes from, from that, right? Investors pick up on the fact that you're, you're out there hustling and pitching, 
Um, you can game it a little bit. When I was consulting the startups, I remember we were down on Sand Hill Road, and we were going from one pitch meeting to another, and I think we le accidentally left the logo of one of the other VC firms on the deck, and we go in there, and, and you know, the, the moment the other investors saw that, they kind of paid a little bit more attention. Um, <laughs> another time, uh, I think the CEO I was working with left his email, little pop-up notifications on, right? So we're going to the deck, and a little pop-up notification comes on, you know, <laughs> confirming a meeting with another VC. Like, everyone's, you know, just kind of sat up straight and uh, paid a little bit more attention to the rest of that picture. I don't suggest actually trying to game that, but, um, <laughs> but again, you know, if you have a lot of meetings compressed, you can kind of exude that momentum. Um, and then again, you know, being prepared for a full-time commitment around this activity, and maybe getting an ulcer. My dad's a doctor, and I actually called him at one point in the middle of our fundraising, and then, yeah, I think I'm getting an ulcer. I'm waking up every morning with like a pain in my stomach at 4 a.m. Can you write me a prescription? The prescription was like $140, so I didn't end up uh, taking the prescription, and it didn't get an ulcer, but it felt like it, right? That's the stress level of fundraising. Okay, I'm gonna go through these pretty quick. We did a few other kind of hacks. Um, you know, the caveat is, I don't know how much of these are really effective, but I actually took everyone I was pitching, put them into a Facebook ad, and I was doing some retargeting. I think Sam, who was a, one of our angel investors, actually commented one time, he's like, every time I log into Facebook, I see your freaking <laughs> logo. And, you know, he did write a check, so maybe it worked. Um, Using Fabricry or Doxin or some other place to host your pitch deck so you can actually track who's viewing your deck, super useful, right? You know who's paying attention to your to your stuff. Uh, and some of those I've actually put back into retargeting. So we had a kind of a, an online marketing. Now these next up are about AngelList. We actually got, um, I think we raised about, or had commitments for about 70% of our round, and then we went on AngelList and put up our page Everyone who had committed, I had them come in and you know mark themselves as committed. And then I went out and asked all my other investor friends who weren't going to put money into Founder Street, but who were friendly to me, I had them request an intro, which helped us trend. We were trending for like two weeks. And I don't even know, Angels changes so frequently, I don't know if any of this works, but um, you know, the trending got us another like 150k pretty easily. Um, and you know, we kind of gamified it a little bit. Explore syndicates and A-list intros, we talk about that. And then, you know, to the extent you can do an initial close, say you're raising 500 k initially, first tranche 500 k you know, if you have 300 k in commitments on a 500 k close, it looks better than 300 k in commitments on a $1.5 million close. The little meter bar just looks more sexy. Um, I'm gonna skip the other stuff in the interest of time. You know, go for the close. This is something I can't emphasize enough. In working with startups and just talking to lots of startups, we've got about 2,000 startups using our platform right now for the fundraise, and I talk to a lot of these guys. I see this all too often where they, they get a couple commitments or they think their, their fundraising is coming in for a landing, and they take their foot off the gas pedal, and then something happens, uh, Trump's elected or whatever happens, but things cool off, sorry. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't commit, and then they've lost that momentum. So the point of this first one is, you know, keep pushing all the way. It's hard, right? You've got a business to run, you've got employees to manage, you've got all kinds of other things to do while fundraising, and fundraising is a pretty much full-time job, but don't let up until that money is actually in the bank. Can't emphasize that enough. It takes a lot of meetings to get this. The more term sheets you have, obviously the more leverage you have, the faster you can drive it all towards a close. And then, you know, Putting it in context, it's actually very hard to get a no from a lot of people, right? You get a lot of interesting but too early um, without ever telling you exactly you know, what they're looking for. Um, uh, you get every version of no that's not really a no. Uh, if they say, if you meet with an investor and they say, they conclude the meeting by saying, how can I help? That's a no, unfortunately. Has anyone heard how can I help at the end of a pitch meeting? Yeah, it's like, oh, geez, uh, he just gave me a no. All right, thanks. Um, and then finally, when you do get someone to say yes over coffee or whatever it may be, this PG's Handshake Deal Protocol, it's Paul Graham's Handshake Deal Protocol, there's a link there. 
essentially that means you, you know, after that coffee meeting where they say I'm in for 25, you go back, write them an email saying just to confirm you're in for 25, write me back, confirm that's correct, and then you've created kind of a, a virtual or a, 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 a a loop, you know, proving that they're really in. If they won't email you back saying, yes, I'm in, they're not really in. Um, let's see here. So, drive it all, don't let up, push for that yes or no. And then, you know, we've got the, <laughs> the money shot here. <laughs> I just love it. And then finally, um, we're almost done here. You know, keep in mind that once you've raised a C round or a series A round, that's just the very start. You now have 12 months, maybe 18 months to get to your next set of milestones, but you gotta do it all over again. So, um, you know, go get them, have fun, don't let up, and uh, that's it. Any quick questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, sure. Um, email me, Nathan at Patterson Street. You probably all got my email from attending this. Just shoot me a note. We've got some promo codes on the um, if you want to use our CRM or search tools, um, let's do a quick time check. Yeah, so unless there's any burning questions, should be a, a request for the deck. Otherwise, we're going to move on. Is Elad here? Elad here? Yes. Cool. All right, thanks, guys. So. <laughs> come on up. So uh, I'm excited for this. Good to see you. Good up. Um, let's see, where do you, yeah, oh, let me plug you in. <laughs>